Good evening, everybody. It's college and complexes. And uh, tonight we have a special speaker, Gary uh, Christ, uh, who will tell us something about regaining land for agriculture from landmines. Okay? There are lots of landmines in the world, particularly in the what? Let's see, Yugoslavia, Cambodia, uh, Latvia, Sri Lanka, and in Africa, uh, East Africa particularly, uh, West Africa has its shape. Uh, also, also uh, they probably they have a lot of uh, landmines and the those that they drop from the air cluster bombs. Cluster bombs uh, in uh, Lebanon and. Uh, I'm going to put you down for a speech. Or... Yeah. Well, uh, please, please. <laughs> yes, Chief. <laughs> Hi, Chief. Hi. Uh, without further ado, our speaker, Mr. Chris. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. And I want to express my thanks for the free dinner. Sue, that was delicious. You got me kind of have come, coming back, that's for sure. Thank you. I'm waiting for that apple pie. I'll take some off my mouth. <laughs> I want to thank Tim Bolger for inviting me here and helping with the, with the video, and Paul, who did some last minute work for me to. I think the handouts are all uh, easy to read. I have to start off by saying, so today, so today, nobody from Cambodia here, I see. Has anyone ever been to Cambodia? No one here. Well, I invite you all to go to Cambodia. It's a wonderful place. I've been there now 12 times. It was 2001 when I first went. And I'm going to be talking tonight about something that you can do to save someone's life. I'm very close to developing this machine that I believe will revolutionize the mining technology in the world. And tonight we have an opportunity to prevent someone from getting blown up. I've been to Cambodia 12 times, but before I would expect you to follow what I'm saying or have any respect for, for my efforts, I thought I should tell you just a little bit about me and why I'm here. Uh, and I want to give a, uh, a round of applause for Ron. He pronounced my name right. It is pronounced Gary Christ. Uh, it is my real name. And we got some troubles with, with this, but I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> this is working less than a bomb, you know. <laughs> we can solve it. All right. When I was five years old, my parents moved us out to a farm in Crystal Lake, Illinois. And so I was raised on a farm, and I, I had a great life. It was my father always taught his four boys to try to build things bigger and better, think out of the box a little bit, and, and go ahead and, and try to live your dreams. When I was in 1975, I graduated high school, and at that point, I had a whole world in my hands. I, I could do anything. I, I could. I had the greatest uh, uh, opportunity for education and health care. But in a place called Cambodia, 1975 was called Year Zero. That's when Pol Pot came into power and decided to set the calendar back to Year Zero. He was going to start a whole new generation of the most severe communism the world's ever seen. Of course, I didn't really have much interest in Cambodia at that time. I was involved with farming, and, and my father said, Gary, if you really want to make, biz uh, make money in business, go into the, the sewer business. And so that's what I did. I started pumping septic tanks and cleaning sewers, and that's what I did. And then the pastor of my church said, Gary, we need people like you in Cambodia. The sanitation there is so poor, 
Do they need people to go there and, and dig ditches and show them how to install septic systems? So that's what I did since 2001. It was 2005 when I was there, and they asked me to put a septic system in. And I said, no, I'm, I'm real busy right now. But I found out later that at that point there was a landmine right in that area where I was going to work. Now, Cambodia has millions of landmines left over from the conflict they had during the 70s, 80s, up to the 90s. They were still planting landmines in Cambodia. Well, I'd like you to do just a little bit of an introduction here. What we have here is... you want the video? Yeah, actually, this, this one. Okay, put that microphone next to the speakers, Gary. through a field in Cambodia. The problem is, is if you will go now to this part, yes, the, the enduring problems of landmines and, and cluster bombs. This is a, about a five minute PowerPoint. I, you can just, uh, I'll, I'll do the clicking here. Thank you. Paul. This is in Cambodia. Uh, I should say that I got this PowerPoint off the internet. I didn't actually make it, but it's fitting for what I uh, tonight's presentation. What I what thought I should do for people who know nothing about landmines is give, sure, is give j just a, a brief introduction as to the, the history of landmines. They were first developed by the Chinese, and they would just plant black powder in the ground and put rocks over it. And then when uh, a, an opposing force would come, they would set off the black powder and it would send rocks all over the, the enemy. That's basically what they kind of looked at as a diagram. And then of course, uh, the 19, uh, the, the Civil War, America, 1860-65, developed the first anti-personnel landmine developed by the Confederates. It was wide, widely used in World War I, World War II, and there's still lots of these unexploded landmines from World War II in Europe. It's a very, basically, a simple device a landmine is activated by pressure. You step on it, they're buried in the ground, and the, the pressure of a foot will detonate it, and it, it's meant to explode, but not to kill you. This is kind of a, a, a horrible thing. You'd think that a well, landmine should be designed to kill you, but no. If it takes your leg off, or it takes both your legs off, your arm, it takes two or three people to take care of you out off the field. It takes two or three people to transport you to the hospital. So what it does is it takes more people out of the uh, front line because of one injury. So the landmine is, again, it's not designed to kill you, it's designed to take your, take your leg off, seriously maim you. Most of them are rather small. Uh, the most of them are very cheaply made, under $3. Three dollars for one landmine, and it will last in the ground for uh, over 30 years. We're talking about some of the people here, uh, the different types of landmines, the uh, different shapes and um, sizes of them, depending on, on what they're designed specifically for. Uh, some of the landmines, actually, when you step on them, they don't go off until you take your foot off. And then they go up in the air, and then they blow up, and then they kill all your friends around you or injure your comrades. Well, this line here I thought was quite interesting. They say that landmines are about a dollar. I've heard three dollars a piece. 
and it can cost uh, up to $1,000 just to remove one landmine. It sounds like a lot of money, $1,000, but what if you were to step on that landmine? How much would it cost for the doctor care? So it's very important that the landmines be removed. Of course, the protocol for installing landmines is that you keep very excellent records of where you put them in. So when the conflict is over, you want to remove the landmines. You have a map, you have a system where you can remove the landmines. But in Cambodia, they did not map where they put the landmines. They just stuck them wherever they felt it was needed and they go away. The after effects of landmines, after the conflict has, has ended, is just horrible. My first interaction with a Cambodian in 2001 was with a double amputee begging on the streets. Uh, I just can't say how shocking that was to see somebody without any protection on his legs, nothing to propel himself other than his two hands, just on the, on the street, just begging for money. Now, this is very common. This looks like Africa. And so now what happens after the conflict? We still have the landmines in the ground. The farmers still have to go out and uh, hold their crops. They still have to go out in the woods and, and gather firewood chase their cows, and there could still be landmines there. Uh, one thing I'd like you to go away with tonight is that when, you, when one person steps on a landmine, it doesn't affect just that one person. It affects the entire family. The entire family becomes impoverished. And that's something that you don't really think until you go there and you see what happens to the whole family when a landmine uh, it, it hurts someone. These are the areas that are most heavily uh, landmined. In uh, South America, especially Colombia, uh, besides all Southeast Asia. So it's a huge problem. They say there's more landmines in the ground now than ever. So. It is a, a huge widespread problem. Uh, so every 22 minutes, somebody is, uh, steps on one. Someone here mentioned Princess Diana, the Halo Trust. Uh, a wonderful lady. Uh, she established a a demining organization that's removed more landmines than any other organization in the world. And they're very, very active in Cambodia. And they're, they're interested in this machine. Oh, I could talk all night about the International Committee to Ban Landmines, but I just have a few slides here. Uh, of course, Cambodia is a member of the International Committee. And their desire is to have Cambodia rid of landmines by 2010. It's 2012, and we're, we're still far, far from that. So we're trying to uh, coordinate our efforts with other countries to demine Cambodia. This lady, uh, uh, Jody Williams, she received the Nobel Peace Prize for her uh, founding of the International Committee to Ban Landmines. Uh, interesting story how one person can really make a difference. I'm here to encourage people. If you think you can make a difference in life, you certainly can. She's one of them. Saved thousands and thousands of lives because of her efforts. Uh, the current status is so unreal when you go to a, a country where they are camp, uh, the landmines are prevalent, like in Cambodia. It's, it's a whole different scene when you see truck after truck after truck with D-miners in there going out. And amputees just all on the streets. It's just, it's, it's just like a horrible scene from a terrible movie. There's still, of course, landmines being used. They're still being made by many different countries. Uh, these are all countries that still manufacture them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, removing mines, that's what we're here to talk about tonight, basically, is how do we get rid of these killers? Of course, uh, being raised on a farm and, and uh, a machine operator, I'm always thinking of mechanical ways. And of course, a lot of other people have been too. <laughs> this is we're one of the demining machines. It's actually a, a, a big rototiller. Now, this is the old-fashioned method. They're still using it. It's the it's the most common method. It's basically probing the ground every square inch with a 
like a, a, a saber, and the idea is that you touch the landmine on the side, not on the detonator. So you hit something solid, then you dig up around it. Very, very time consuming. But that's that's the most common way of doing it. So of course my idea is to speed up the process. This is some of the gear that's used for walking, walking in a line a landmine field. Protective gear. Maybe I need to get a pair of boots like that. But not everyone can afford the proper gear. He's just in uh, rubber boots. Of course, new technology is being thought of every day. They've got rats to find them and uh, bees and uh, a new type of a plant. What I say is, and, and the deminers have told me, there's no one silver bullet when it comes to demining. What may work in one situation may not work in another, and vice versa. So that's my purpose is just to support the demining community with new tools, new new methods. Oh yeah, good news is they're making great headway in removing the landmines. If you do go to Cambodia, I encourage you all to see the landmine museum, where uh, the CNN, one of the CNN heroes of the year, Akira, uh, 2010. He's credited with removing 50,000 landmines by himself just right out of the ground. He is one of the men working with me on this machine. So what, what can we do? And I think number one is to educate ourselves. What is the problem? I encourage try to meet somebody who who has Cambodian descent in them. And you'll feel the, the deep culture they have, the deep love of the, the, their uh, country and the, their civilization. They really want to help them once you, you really get to know them. Uh, supporting NGOs that help the people with uh, disabilities. Uh, Clear Path International, Handicap International. I know these people are wonderful people. And we talk about cluster bombs. Now, a cluster bomb is different than a landmine. They're Landmines are individually put in the ground, whereas a cluster bomb is a, a large bomb that has maybe uh, 200 to 1,000 small bombs, and they just dispersed over a large area. And, and they're supposed to explode when they hit the ground, but a lot of them don't. So when kids see uh, things like that, they pick them up not knowing what they are. And then sometimes they go off and it injures or kills the person. This is a, a cluster bomb dispersing its bomblets. These are scattered now in Cambodia from the recent conflict they had with Thailand. Thailand used American-made cluster bombs. Now, if I was a kid, I, I'd want to pick one of those up. You've seen it laying out in the field. you think, I'll oh, take it home and show mom. So that is the question. Do we need these landmines? Can we get rid of them? The answer is the landmines are called the perfect soldier. Will we ever get rid of them? No. I'm sure China, Russia, United States, a lot of countries are still going to want these. Maybe they're doing good in Korea. There's over a million landmines put on the border of North Korea and South Korea. I tell you, they work. <laughs> But the problem is, is when the conflict is over and it's returned back to the farmers, that's the big problem. That's when the landmines have to get out of the ground. So that's what I'm here to help to encourage you to help me make the next step with that project. Okay, um, we'll get to the questions later on. I just wanted to give you just a, a brief rundown on, on what landmines are, a little bit of the history. And, the reason I'm here tonight is to introduce to the Chicagoland area a new method of mechanical demining. People ask me, well, are you an engineer? And I go, no, I'm, I'm a farmer, but yet I have a heart to see that when there's a problem, sometimes we don't need an engineering degree to solve it. Maybe we just need common sense. 
So, of course, I looked at all of the devices that were being used for mechanical mining. And there's many of them out there. Most of them go back to the World War II days with the, the chains on the front of a tank. And the chains would whip the ground and hopefully the, the chains would, would hit a landmine and set it off. Another thing that I think we need to know is the difference between humanitarian demining and military demining. Military demining is if you get 80% of the landmines, that's good enough to send the troops in. Not good enough for humanitarian demining. That's why the methods that use for military demining, that the chain in front of a tank, isn't really suitable for humanitarian demining. It's too destructive to the environment, they're too heavy. So I, I felt that it would be better to make a machine that would be easier to use in the field, easier to repair, cheaper to build, cheaper to everything. So I'd like to go to
does it, Paul? The machine is basically a reciprocating hammer that uses. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, Harry Porterfield took a real interest in this machine, as a lot of people do. And you see the result of what a, one landmine can do to one person, and you see how simple that danger can be alleviated by just simply dropping a hammer on it. It's a, it to me, it's such a simple solution. Because the machines they have out there right now, I, I did bring some pictures of the different types of uh, landmine machines. They're mostly made by Japan, and they're very, very expensive, very, very heavy, and there's very, very few of them, mainly because they're so big that they tear up the soil, they break the bridges, <laughs> and they're very, when they, they hit an uh, anti-tank mine, it, it blows them up so bad they, they can't even use them. So we need something that's easier to repair, and that's why I think that this machine meets the requirements that the deminers are looking for. They, they don't want high tech, they don't want heavy, they just want something simple that works. And so that's where I am today. If, uh, please hit the hit. Well, what I showed you, everything was from before I went to Cambodia with the machine. Uh, the, we did send the machine there last year. Uh, the, the video that you saw was done on my farm in, in Crystal Lake. Now Paul will show the video here in Cambodia with my director. You press the, the pause button. Again, please. Uh, 90 weights that each way, uh, 10 kilos each, 2.2 pounds, and they're all attached to a, a chain. Yeah. So they hit different terrain that, that allows it to, to commit the landmine. This AC that is uh, the hand mask is for very heavy. Yeah. And makes it drop on the line quickly by the personal mind. Right. Easy, easy. I have right now is that we sent the machine over there with a small engine and small hydraulic components. By the time we added all the weight of the actual hammer, it got pretty heavy. We need more hydraulic power and everything to get the machine moving. Right now we have the machine that it goes forward and up and down and forward and backwards, but we cannot steer it into position. Mm -hmm. That's why I came back from Cambodia. Six months I was there and I didn't get the machine tested by the Cambodian government because we, we couldn't get our, our steering mechanism to work properly. Tim invited me to speak here tonight, and I thought that if, if there's anyone here that knows somebody that's in the hydraulic fields, knows somebody that would like to help the people of Cambodia, uh, be very much interested in uh, working with anyone that can help this project go forward and save thousands of lives. Uh, I don't know if there's anything I forgot except to ask if there's any questions in the audience. Yes. Let's see. Well, give it a job. Oh. Margaret has the first question. Um, 
you kind of blasted it by the slide that said the reasons that the United States did not sign the landmine ban treaty. And so I wondered if you either could show the slide or if you could just tell us what the problem is. Uh, the reason is, is they did not have a Korean exception to that clause and into the, the uh, treaty. And they feel that the, the positive effect of having a landmine barrier between North Korea and South Korea is an exception to the rule, as opposed to indiscriminately planting landmines in an area which I think almost everyone would think that's a irresponsible way to handle a deadly weapon. America is saying that in some cases it's very important to have a landmine availability to separate <coughs> violent areas. I'm not necessarily agreeing with them, but that, that's what it said on the slide. If you'd like, I can show you this. Uh, Bernie? Yes. Um, are there any landmines out there that do not have a substantial amount of metal in them and therefore would not be detectable with metal detectors. Also, second question, uh, after extended periods of time, do the explosives or other chemicals in these landmines tend to ooze? In other words, might have two separate means of uh, searching the landmines without using physical force. You could search for uh, the presence of explosives and or metal. Uh, could you answer those two? Right. Uh, thank you. The landmines that are used, there's usually, I shouldn't say usually, all that I know of, there's at least one little tiny piece of metal in the landmines. They're in the spring or the primer. And so they can be detected with a landmine with a metal detector. The problem is to pick up something so sensitive as a little tiny spring, they also pick up every other piece of metal that's in the ground. And when I, I have pictures, I have over a thousand pictures of Cambodia, but I take pictures of the place where they cleared, and they show how many pieces of scrap metal they found for every one landmine. And it's usually uh, somewhere around a thousand false readings for every one landmine. So that's what takes so long, is that when they go with their metal detector, they get a beep there, beep there, beep there. Then they got to check each one out with that steel rod. And that's very, very time consuming. And a lot of them are are not volatile anymore. The, like you say, maybe for some environmental reason, the explosive is, is, is non-active, the primer does not work. But how can you tell that with, just by looking at it? That's why I call this machine a peace hammer. If it's dead, and the hammer drops on it with 10 times more force than a human step. In my book, that would be considered safe, not volatile. But another deminer will look at it, they'll probe it, and they go, we have a landmine here. We have to treat it as if it's alive. And so generally what they do is they put more explosives in that same area and then remotely detonate it. And to me, that's a lot of extra time and material to detonate something that's not going to detonate in the first place. So we can't really tell other than with uh, uh, ground penetrating radar. That's the latest technology is that they will detect. It's easier to detect the mass of a landmine than as opposed to a metal detector just picking up the little pieces of metal. So technology is being uh, 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 arriving daily. Like I said they have bees, rats, and even some flowers that detect the TNT. So the idea is there's such a large area in Cambodia that we really need more mechanical demining machines to go out there and do it. How much does a hammer weigh in your place? Uh, there's 90 hammers and each one weighs about 22 pounds, about a ton altogether. But it can, it can vary in size. It's about the size of this tabletop. Explosion, but when you detonate a mine with that going on, doesn't that destroy the front of the machine? Well, this is what everyone thinks. And I know just enough about physics that if you can divert the force, 
vent it out somewhere else as opposed to having it go directly into the charge up, you'll deflect a, a lot of the energy away from it. So we designed the, the hammers to do that, deflect the, the uh, force as well as direct the energy into tires. On this, these pictures here, I have tires and tires upon tires. And my best way to describe that is if I were to have a tire between me and Ernie Banks, he's still around. Ron Santo, he's not here anymore. I'm going back to the 60s, the Cubs guys. <laughs> they could swing that bat as hard as they could. As long as I have that tire between me, they're not going to hurt me. Because the tire distorts the energy. And so I use that, the tires in between the explosive nature of the landmine and the, the machine steel to keep it from being damaged. I have a question. You say that your original concern in Cambodia was the sewers, uh, or the sewerage generally. Uh, uh, and, and you, that uh, concern came to you for your church. Uh, tell us about your church. Oh, I glad you asked. If anyone remembers the movie, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Forrest Gump, Gump thanks. <laughs> Near the end, he goes into a little church, a little white church called it. He says, and I even joined the Four Square Church. Well, I went to the Four Square Church. And Four Square Gospel. Four Square Full Gospel Church, right. You remember that, yeah. And uh, the, the pastor there, he went, he was in Laos during the 60s. It was kind of a diversion from the Vietnam War. And he married a Laotian, came back to the United States and became pastors of a church and ended up going back to Southeast Asia and invited me there to work on septic systems. <laughs> so. but. Yeah, there's all different ways you can help people there. Uh, uh, sanitation is a, is a great way to prevent tragedy. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, the, the headline on my uh, on the website is this, Empowering Cambodians for, to Prevent Tragedy. Yes, Tim? All right, how long have you been working on the device? And can you tell us a little bit about <coughs> the uh, problems you had getting the machine even to this point? Right, well, it was 2005. <laughs> When I was in Cambodia, and the same pastor asked me to work on a septic system, and I, I just met my director, Savant, and uh, I, I, I told Ted, I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm real busy here. And then he emailed me, he says, gee, there was a landmine right in that area where we asked you to work here. So it's a good thing I didn't go out there. But since that, that, but that gave me the flash of inspiration to think of an idea of just, just dropping weights on the oh, landmine. Oh. That was 2005. Uh, then Katrina came, and I, I went down to Mississippi to help out there. So I didn't go to Cambodia that one year after Katrina hit. So the idea was kind of put on the back burner because I didn't know how to develop it from just an idea to actually taking the thing to, to Cambodia. And on my own, I, I can't do this. I have to go to the church groups or whoever invites me and tell them what I'm doing if they want to help. Give me your scrap metal. <laughs> I, I wanted to say I, I brought my bib over or else I, I feel more comfortable wearing bibs. But I wear these just kind of as a symbolic nature to say that I'm ready to work. If you got something that can help me get going, I'll throw these on. And I got my truck over in my friend's house. <laughs> we'll get some work done. Uh, but as far as the development, it's been just through people. I, I go to people in McHenry County that have shops, and I tell them what I'm trying to do, and if they have some material, they help me. It's just been, uh, that's why it's taken so long to, to get this far. But I will say, where are we today? That's a good question. Gene Anderson? I just finished my, my where, where I'm at today is, on Christmas Day 2011, we met with the Prime Minister's son, Prime Minister of Cambodia's son. He saw this machine, 
<coughs> I've been to the International Committee to Ban Landmines. I've been to the uh, CMAC, the Cambodia Mine Action Center, the MAG, Mine Action Group, and another group there, uh, Kira's group. They're all very excited about seeing this thing work. That's where we're at. We just don't have the machine quite ready for the testing. So I just want to give you a current status of where it's gone from 2005, from first inception to where we're at today. And that's the machine with the big engine, with, where we're just lacking the remote controls and the hydraulic unit to propel it the way we like to. Uh, I got in mind a church like the Mormon church. They have uh, members to go out to different parts of the world to do humanitarian, wonderful things. Are uh, your church in that, or this was coincidental because of his marriage? Uh, is stand there, uh, do your church send different people different places to help when they kept the need? That's a good question. Uh, there's a lot of Mormons out there doing what you say, generally going out two by two. We have a different approach. We try to do humanitarian work, take care of the orphans, the widows, the sick, whereas the Mormons are basically trying to use words to spread their message, we try to use actions. And so, yeah, there's many people from California, church, uh, Foursquare Church is big in California. They send a lot of people up to, to Cambodia. Basically, they do like I do, dig trenches, paint buildings, put up fence, whatever it does to show that the orphans and the kids that you know, we're not too big to, or too rich to, to help these people, we still love them the same. Ruth Bolger? And Gary, has anybody done any numbers on these things, like how much a machine would cost and how much for the hydraulic, you know, whatever it is? I mean, have, has anybody ever done any, you know, to transport these machines or, you know, how can, how to get around to making these machines workable and then mass producing them so they could do some good? Has any work ever been done on that yet? Yes. It's I, I've had to do that work, of course, to make, see if this is actually feasible. Because inventors can always think, oh, their idea is great, but they really have to put the paper to the pencil, compare what's being done, do the numbers. And the machine that I've invented, because it is so much lighter, it's so much less costly to manufacture, they can manufacture them right in Cambodia. That's the other big issue, is to provide jobs for the people with disabilities. They, they don't really have very, they have very few options, people with disabilities in Cambodia. But if we can introduce a way to the, uh, build machinery there with scrap material, the other way I make money is I scrap metal. I see so much scrap metal going to the scrap yards that they chop it up, send it to China, and they turn it into steel. Why don't we just send this, the steel as it is right to Cambodia where they can cut it up and use it to build these machines. So I'm trying to find lower cost ways more common sense ways to get the job done. To, to, to mass produce, I'd like to produce 100 of these machines in the near future. Have you approached any of these uh, industries, you know, that John Deere or some truck Caterpillar International Harvester. Yeah, have you Commons, presented yeah. any of these spe speeches to the entrepreneurs there and maybe try to enlist their help? I've not spoken before the group. I've written letters to try to see if they have any interest in sponsoring humanitarian demining. And John Deere Caterpillar's International Harvester also no reply. But that doesn't mean you need to give up, of course. So I go on through so the congressperson. You know, your congressman. Yeah, Congressman Manzulo. Yeah, he he directed me to DARPA. And they're such a high-tech outfit. And just to, What's DARPA? DARPA, I have to look that on the internet. I wish I knew the acronym. Man. That's the Defense Apartment Agency for Advanced uh, Research or something like that. Something like that. They were the ones who invented the internet, who kind of helped develop the internet. Well, what I'm looking for is somebody more like uh, uh, Richard Branson, or, uh, well, too bad, Prince Diana isn't here anymore. But somebody that, that wouldn't mind investing $100,000.
Let's see if this, let's see if this thing's really going to work. Let's see if we can save lives for hundred thousand dollars. If I can find one person like that, we could. I, I feel we could change the world. Most of those mines are from the uh, Vietnam War and Cambodian CNO regime that, say, 30, 35 years ago. Right. Is that where they were from? Most of them were in that area, uh, era of uh, 70s and 80s. The most heavily mined area in the world is right near where I live. It's called the K5 mine belt. They put three landmines for every square meter in there. There's millions of them, and it's just one area. And it, it's impossible to cross that area between Cambodia and Thailand. So millions of them are still on the ground. It's crazy. Yes. To keep people from escaping Cambodia into Thailand, they, they mine the border. So, and it's very effective. Margaret? Have you approached any of the people who make these things here, our munitions industries, to um, no. guilt? <laughs> no. I haven't personally. I know that there's some anti uh, landmine groups in the Chicagoland area. Um, Landmines Blow is one of them. I've actually met people in Cambodia that are from this area. As an individual, I guess I feel a little bit weak to be a group like Therapath International or Handicap International supporting this issue that I think I get a lot more respect and uh, I go further than on my own. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Do any uh, landmines have depleted uranium? Do any landmines have depleted uranium? Uh, not the ones in in Cambodia do not. I would doubt that they have now in Iraq and Afghanistan. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. But like I say, the, the landmines, they're not made like grenades. A grenade has a hard shell that sends shrapnel out. Where a landmine is plastic. And just the force of that dirt, just ripping against your leg, is enough to peel the skin off where you have to amputate your leg. So it's, you don't need that heavy, dense metal for the landmines to be effective for what they do. We are so clever, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're good at killing each other. <laughs> I, I'm wondering, uh, does the Cambodian government uh, fund the demining operations, or? Does it have to be done by individual farmers, uh, or are there other groups uh, that uh, do it? Uh, and uh, what? Uh, um, I, I suppose land values are uh, rather uh, for mine land. Uh, their value has fallen to nothing or next to nothing. Uh, are, are people speculating on the, the land? Uh, and uh, would uh, large enterprises fund uh, uh, the uh, D mining in order to buy up a lot of land for? That's a really good question. Because, yeah, who wants to buy land that has landmines on it? Unless you get it really, really cheap. <laughs> and you don't care if somebody, if your milk gets blown off. That's unfortunate. That's what happens, though. Uh, but as far as the demining efforts, uh, I, well, I'm proud of that the United States does support more dollars in demining than any other country. Uh, Norway is second. They've got oil. <laughs> yeah. Lots of fish, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's basically humanitarian demining that they, they fund. 
what happens to the land after that, we hope that it goes right back into the community. But uh, one of the most interesting speeches that uh, Tim gave was uh, about uh, land rights, property rights. And how, how can a country ever become successful if they don't have property rights? And this is the big issue in Cambodia. People are pushed off their property. A big foreign investor comes in there, buys a big track of land, forces everybody out, cuts the trees down, plants rubber trees. Yeah, and the poor people are basically transients. Yeah. yeah, we did the same thing to the American Indians, basic yeah. natives, so. Or they got to go to the city and a lot of problems. But I, I just, yeah, again, I want to encourage you to, to think about going to Cambodia. You'll meet some wonderful people there and uh, you can really make a difference. Any other questions? So, another question, Ruth? Well, it was seen to me. Ruth had another question. Yeah, I did. Because it would seem to me like, for some, a dummy like me, that if it doesn't say on off, I know nothing about machinery. However, how do we as individuals help this? Do you have uh, some kind of a fund, uh, an organized fund set up? To it? Because if you need somebody with $100,000, you might get 100,000 people with $1 and still meet your goal. And is there some place where the money could safely be invested and to be sure that it went into what it was intended for? You know, like a you know, $5 donation or something. Sure. I, I do have a bank account set up for Angkor Association for Disabled. That's a little fire here. They basically helped the landmine survivors, started by the man I was talking about, some Savanta. Army captain. Uh, I uh, I don't sponsor a 501c3 not for profit here in this country for various reasons. You know, but you can't be so political. But the charity here in Cambodia, they're registered in Cambodia. So what I do is I use their name for raising funds and then I send the money to the Cambodians through Western Union. That's what I do. But it's not a, 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 a it's not a tax deductible contribution. But does it go to the development of your machine? That's what I wanted to know. Specifically for that, is there some way people could send get together with some kind of a fund fund for specifically for your purposes? That can be arranged. Right now what we do is I, I split the money up on my website. It says for, for like every dollar we get in, half goes to sanitation and wells, and half goes to demining. Because it's, I, I can't just go into a community and, and see people drinking out of the ditch and not think they need a well. Or to see them defecating there, it's like, you know, what does it take to put a toilet in here? You know, $300, something like that. So it's not, yes, it's not all demining, it's, it's basically humanitarian work. Again, I got other pictures here of some of the other work that we do there. It's water sanitation, taking care of uh, the sick, finding jobs and shelter for people, and development of new ideas. So that's, I have a question. Sure. Yes, uh, I, I know that in Vietnam, uh, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists uh, had hospitals and uh, uh, there were uh, Roman Catholic uh, missions there too. And, and I know that uh, the United Methodist uh, Committee on Relief does a lot of uh, relief work all over the world. Uh, wouldn't some uh, such uh, organization, Caritas for the Roman Catholics, and oh, Jenka, uh, Church World Service, Jesuits. You know, yes. would, would, uh, don't, <laughs> who do you think would have an interest particularly in Cambodia or in, in uh, 
say uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina or uh, uh, the in Africa, the uh, uh, either in Eastern Africa where, where uh, there's been a long war between Eritrea and uh, uh, Ethiopia, and uh, there's a lot of war between, uh, it's still going on between the north, the north of the Sudan and the south, and, uh, and then uh, there, in, in Congo. I mean, there, there are plenty of places where there are lots of landmines and other destruction. Uh, what uh, church agencies uh, have been approached on this, and uh, what, what are their concerns? That's a great question, because there are a lot of churches in Cambodia trying to give provide relief for the people who stuff on landmines. Uh, I've got great pictures of Denise Coglin, a wonderful nun. Uh, she's very instrumental with, with this kind of work. My stumbling block right now is that until the machine gets tested by the Cambodian government, nobody can use it. Oh. Yeah. So I can't I can't approach these people and say, I got this great machine that will uh, re reduce the cost of removing landmines. Because you're right, everyone is appalled at the idea that landmines are, are out there that can uh, uh, hurt innocent people. They'd love to see them all gone, but how do you do it? There's millions of them out there. It's costing anywhere from 300 to to $1,000 a piece to remove one. If we can take, let's say, remove one for less than $10, I think all the Agencies would, would love that. I, I could go over again talk right to Denise Coughlin. She's most probably, if not the top lady, top person in the Jesuit Relief Services in Cambodia. She knows who it is, <laughs> but she's approachable just like anyone here. She's very nice. She knows what I'm doing, but until I get that certification from the government saying, okay, we've approved this for use, I'm just dust in the wind. So I need that boost to get the, the machine tested. Well, if you work through the various relief uh, aid agencies, I, I would think that they would be able to promote and to inter make intercessory efforts uh, that would help. Well, being that's kind of a, a, that's a touchy subject because no one wants to get injured by anything. You don't want to support something that's not proven and, and approved. That, that's the whole problem is and until it meets that criteria by the government, I'm, I'm relying on individual support, group support, any kind of sponsorship to, to get that next uh, phase of, of progress. Do you have a prototype machine here in the United States? I have a, I do. I have one here. Where is it? In my farm in Crystal Lake. In Crystal Lake? Yes. Yes. Dave Sucker? Excuse me. Um, you mentioned that your church has sent you over there. What did, I was curious, what denomination is your church? Well, at that time, it was the Foursquare Foursquare Full Gospel Church. Okay, Amy Simple McPherson's church. Right, yeah. Okay, what is it now? Well, since I've been, you mentioned the uh, Seventh Day Adventist. Okay. When I went to Cambodia, I met so many wonderful Seventh Day Adventists. I started going to their church. I, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not baptized with them or anything. Okay. I'm, I'm just here to serve the Lord. Okay. So it's, are we all? Um, even though uh, some, of them, some of us try to serve the, the, the people directly without the Lord's intervention. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think you will accept that gift too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is I do not have a Facebook account. For some reason, I'm just a little bit afraid that I'm not going to be responsible enough to answer the different people that might be interested in this. I'm, I'm just a laborer during the day. I, I work 8, 10 hours a day outside and I, I just don't do all the necessary behind the, the screen work that I should do. Were, were you aware that there are um, websites you know, that allow people to donate um, to various, so if you were starting up a nonprofit organization, these websites would well, post. Yeah, that's where I think it really gets started, is to start that 501c3 before they would even ask you. Like, I, I can't always go into uh, expect to get an invitation if I'm not a registered 501c3, registered nonprofit, which I am not. So it's kind of a, it's a catch-22. In order to get the support, you need to be the 501c3. To be a 501c3, then you need to meet special requirements and pertain to certain rules, which I'm not always so good at when it comes. Like, I'm politically motivated. And I, I think, from what I understand, if you're a 501c3, you can't have, you can't be public about your political feelings. You can't, you can't endorse candidates. You can't endorse candidates. You can endorse issues, yes. but not candidates. Not candidates. No. So you can be very, do that. very vocal about issues, okay. as many of our Christian brethren are. Mm -hmm. But you cannot, you are not allowed to endorse a candidate like huh. some of them have done. And they have lost their tax exempt status because of that. That's good to know. Keep that in mind. That's Thank you. <laughs> that's that's what, good to know. That's what happens when you're an atheist. You find out that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great question. Do you have any more, Tim? Do you have a question? A um, no. couple. One thing is, uh, can you tell me a little bit about where a group called Toastmasters has fit in to help you along with your organization? I'm glad you asked that. One of the flyers I didn't stick on there was the Toastmasters flyer. Is there anyone here who doesn't know what Toastmasters is? Yeah, we know. Yeah, okay. Well, for those who don't know, <laughs> yeah, we know. Yeah. They say one of the biggest fears of anyone is public speaking. And I was a person who did not want to public speak. But once I started going to Cambodia and I'm trying to raise money for different issues, I realized I had to learn how to put one of these in front of my face and look at people and, and talk to them in a coherent manner. And so I wanted to change the world in 2002 and I, I, there was an opportunity to become the governor of Illinois. So my friend says, well, if you go for the nomination process, uh, I'll nominate you, but you have to join Toastmasters. <laughs> so when I gave my speech at the Libertarian govern, govern, uh, Governor's uh, nomination, I gave the worst speech I ever could give, you know. But the funny part is, I only lost by 99 votes. How much did the other guy go? There was only 102 people voting. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of the nomination committee, yeah, just me and my two friends, the only people that voted for me, so I realized it was kind of a set-up thing, but the, the, the good part is it did get me into Toastmasters, and that enabled me to uh, get more confidence and give a, um, a better platform for fundraising, and there's an article I put here. This newspaper uh, magazine article came from the Toastmasters magazine, and it did a great job and I got donations from Australia, and a lady from Iran sends me money every now and then. So you never know. But I, I recommend Toastmasters. It's a fun group, very supportive, and can change the world. All right. Suppose we move now to the uh, rebuttal section where your comments make the program. Okay, and of course, Gary, you will have the final word. Oh, okay. I like that. <laughs> so take careful notes.
<laughs> yes, I knows. We no, might come up with some that. wisdom or something. <laughs> And I see that Mike Wittort is our first rebutter. Brown, aren't we going to find out how many we have and apportion the time accordingly? Ten minutes. Yes, how many things that they might be doing? I go right over here. One. Five. Twenty minutes each. Oh, one for Frank. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. <laughs> six of us. We'll probably <coughs> make fools of ourselves. <coughs> Go about ten minutes, Brom. Oh, what? Please. About eight to ten minutes. What Maybe five. At least ten minutes, yeah. Um, like it'll be a ten fifteen. I'm going to give you up to six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. And then right. what are you going to do with the uh, extra, extra hour? We'll go, go home, home early. <laughs> you can go home early. I'd like to talk to these people. <laughs> you got house, right? <laughs> Always. You get it? And see, the, the Nazis <laughs> could leave the room now if you'd yeah. like to. No, the Nazis would not let you talk. Don't you get it, honey. That's why six million Jews got cooked. Hey, don't you um, not my people. <laughs> welcome to... Saturday Night Live for the Homeless. Um, I think this guy's got a good program here. I've been all over the world with my medical program, but I always keep coming back to the United States because I realize what's going on here with uh, our illustrious president bankrupting the world. Um, I don't know how many people were killed in Cambodia because of landmines. But I'll tell you, every day in the United States, 2,200 people die from licensed doctors. And maybe when you get done with uh, removing these millions of landmines from Cambodia, you can come back here and help me start removing doctors from the uh, roles of the taxpayers here in, in the United States. Because I think, uh, what, what's the total population of Cambodia? Do you know that? 13 million, okay. In 13, the last 13 years in the United States, 13 million Americans are dead from licensed doctors. Now, Paul Pot did a pretty fast, how long did he have the killing fields going? How many years? Five years, okay? In five years, he killed two million people, okay? In five years, we killed five million people. We could take the population of Norway off the planet in five years. Just bring them over here, introduce them to doctors, and you wouldn't have a man, woman, or child in Norway. I just got back from a month over there working with multiple sclerosis, uh, asthma, hypertension, fibromyalgia, and things like that, okay? It was a wonderful experience. As I mentioned to you earlier, I'd love to go to Cambodia, and I see your eyes light up when you see alternative medicine uh, over there where we can use urine therapy to stop some of these infections that are uh, showing up on this uh, board over here, this um, uh, dream board, I'd call it. Very simple. Um, I don't know if, if it's used for you that aren't living in a cave. Um, GlaxoSmithKline, one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world, was just fined three B I billion dollars for fraud of putting up drugs on the open market for purposes that they were never intended for. The main one was giving antidepressants to little children and having them commit suicide. I think in one of my speeches, I showed you a vault uh, entry from Pfizer that showed them testing antidepressants on little children. And this little, little young lady looks like she's around, looks like a teenager. How old are you, young lady? 15. 15 years old. Well, how would you like to be uh, donated to a study 
by a major pharmaceutical company and you take a drug called Zoloft and then be observed on a two-way mirror of how many times you attempt suicide and how many times you think about suicide. Would you like to do that for a little study? No? Well, Pfizer did it. 30 studies on taking little children from 6 to 17 years old and finding out what their suicide ideation was and their suicide attempts. I've got to study out of their vault. Now every pharmaceutical, every pharmaceutical company has a vault and that's where they keep their dead people. And they're very difficult to get into. But I persisted and I got it. What is the ways days I'll bring it in here? I, I know I had it for one of my speeches. Okay? During that time that I had this uh, report, Pfizer lost $132 billion. Because I have a radio program and I started talking about it. Their stock went from $54 a share down to $14 a share during that five years when I was talking about this uh, suicide ideation uh, research that they were doing. They were trying to develop a new market for, for this drug. Okay? Well, it didn't work. They fired their CEO. They fired 36,000 employees. It worked. Okay, now GlaxoSmithKline uh, was using Avandia for a diabetic patients. I think we have a couple of diabetics here, okay? And uh, they're calculating what they're going to do now with uh, the diabetic patients. One of them is for the doctors to explain to the diabetic people the hazards of these diabetic drugs, such as heart attacks, blindness, amputations, diabetic neuropathy, diabetic ulcers. Well, yeah, it's a lot of fun having diabetes these days. It's a lifestyle. They were curing diabetes, 100% of the diabetics in 1936. It was called shut your yap. You changed your lifestyle, your diabetes went, so went away with fresh fruits, vegetables, things like that. It was real simple. I don't have diabetes. Okay? There's a number of people in this room that don't have diabetes. They estimate in the United States 20 million diabetics. That means there's 280 million Americans that don't have diabetes and will never get it because of their lifestyles. So they're feeding uh, in this uh, shark fest on 20 million uh, diabetics saying that oh, all you have to do is cover your bad habit with um, insulin and you can have all the chocolate cake, all the pop, all the uh, puddings, pies, candy bars, eat anything you want. Look at the uh, uh, semi-annual magazine that comes out for diabetics and you see all these chocolate cakes and, and all this stuff and then all these supplies for diabetics. They love people that are stupid. And that's what the Rockefellers have done for the last hundred years, is dumb down America with Zoloft, with um, um, fluoride. And the dumber we get, the sicker we get. I'm treating a cancer patient right now on, uh, at 29th in Indiana. She has a large tumor on her right breast from stress, total stress. And we're working on, on working, uh, getting this resolved. Her statement to me the other day was, you know, Doc, all our industry has gone to China and uh, Korea and Japan and so on. I remember in the 70s seeing many, many semis taking uh, drill presses and all this different equipment to the West Coast and shipping it to China so they could make our... Uh, it, they just deindustrialized the United States, okay? Well, we have a new industry in the United States, and this is what this girl said, because she's suffering from cancer, that the new industry in the United States is illness. It's a trillion dollar business, folks. And I'm trying to stop it. Just like the Rockefellers stopped the alternative medicine 100 years ago, Stuff that was 8,000 years old, like reflexology. I'm a reflexologist. 
It works every time. Oxygen works every time. But they don't want you to know that. That's very sad. And that's what I'm doing. So when you get done with this bomb thing and you pick up all these million um, landmines in Cambodia, you come back here and we'll start working on the doctors. Okay? Because I would go to Cambodia. I've been to um, Haiti and I've been to Ecuador. And I've been to Australia and Hawaii and South America and Canada in England working with my health programs. Okay? And I'd love to go to Cambodia and give it a shot. Okay? Yeah. Oh, we, we got an hour. We, we well, an hour. yeah, but, <laughs> but we got to. We to bring some people in to talk. Uh, we, we, we can go through a second round, but there's other people oh, who would like to keep different. going, so well, let's, let's I'm get. I'm going down to Great Council. We'll see you next week. Excellent speech. Excellent speech. I'm Michael Foley. I haven't got much to say. I just want to say to Mr. Chris, thanks for coming here and talking to us. What you're doing is something worthwhile and successful. And I wish you well. I hope your machine works for you. I hope your machine works well. And I hope you're successful. And I wish you well, sir. Thank you. Yeah, this, this was very inspirational for because I feel like I am uh, totally unable to do anything positive. I am retired, I, I suck my thumb the whole day, and then all of a sudden somebody come and show me why. It's, you can be doing something really, really positive, really wonderful. Um, as a matter of fact, I know a lot about hydraulics. I, I know a lot about designing machines. I, I can draw in AutoCAD and so on. Um, and I even know some places that may be a facility for you to do some of these things. So I will be talking to you. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, besides that we are killing each other in the most horrendous ways, we are also killing life on earth um, and I they call me you don't know that but they call me plastic shit Frank <laughs> in this group and the reason they call me plastic shit Frank is because many years ago I used to uh, dive out of the coast of uh, uh, China uh, South China Sea and uh, I went with this bag when, when I went diving, big, big bag that you have hanging on the side, and whenever I saw a piece of rope or, or strings that they were left by people who drop in or, or they get lost, or yes. bottles or anything, I put them in my bag. I mean, yeah. So when I come out, I say, hey, Frank, why do you have so much shit in there? And uh, well, it's plastic shit. Well, this was many years ago, but today, uh, if you know the statistics, we throw 4,500, 4,500 tons of plastic shit in the sea every day. Every day. A billion tons every year. This is killing not only some of the life on the on the the sea, but it's changing the temperature of the sea, it's changing the salinity of the sea, it's changing the pH of the sea, and it's actually killing some of the plankton and the phytoplankton and the blue algae that is responsible to renewing the oxygen that we breathe from the atmosphere. So we really, really are bunch of criminals in, in front of the environment and in front of each other. So we need to do more work. Like that. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the speaker for coming tonight. I applaud his efforts in Cambodia. I'm glad that he was encouraged by the Church of the Four Square Gospel, which I well didn't know was still around. And I'm pleased that it's in, I'm pleased that it's involved in such humanitarian work. 
However, I didn't get up here to respond so much to him as to Doc Wittor when he was here. First, even if I weren't Jewish, I would say this, but since I am, I'm going to say it anyway. I was angered by his injection of the Holocaust into, no, into something that had absolutely nothing to do with it. You know, the Holocaust and its victims should not be taken in vain. That's number one. Second, he also accused President Obama of bankrupting uh, the world. Well, folks, it was the, regardless of what the president is or is not doing about it, it was the Republicans, some people forget, who got us into this mess in the first place. Yes, president Clinton left office with, with, um, uh, with no deficit at all. To put the Republicans in charge, you might as well put that fox uh, out to guard the hen house. Um, why do they think we should be foolish enough to let them back in again? No, thank you. The Republicans have done nothing but criticize and they have no, no ideas or plans of their own other than to try and give us back the failed policies that, uh, of the past. We once had a mayor in this city by the name of Richard J. Daley, yeah. Mayor Daley the Elder. And what he used to say, and I quote, was, I have been vilified. I have been crucified. I've even been criticized. It's easy to criticize, to find fault. But where are their programs? Where are their priorities? What trees do they plant? Thank you. And what a lot of us forget. People, we are all in the same boat. We are all human beings. In every religion, in every ethic philosophy talks about what we supposed to do for one another. Now, he talking about mind over Kabbalah. Well, I like his tone. First time I met him. He seemed to be genuine in really doing this out of altruism, if that's the right word. And this is what we forget about, man. If you don't do something for somebody else, somebody else ain't gonna do shit for you. <laughs> if this boat go down, you go on like everybody else, man. All you gotta do is look around. All you gotta do is look at history. We are here together. And there's a moral imperative that you do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And you don't need no training. This is a human trait. It comes with you as a human being when you got here. In other words, a cat said, you know this uh, uh, a priori. Ain't nobody got to tell you to do the right thing. We know how to do the right thing. Like Plato said, we've been corrupted from our environment. And we all split it. And we all over here. We all over there. People we here together, and until we learn how to do something for one another, we ain't gonna never be about nothing. Now, no offense to Tim Ogie, he says capitalism in the free market, like that's real, ain't no goddamn capitalism, ain't no free market. But he say that lifts you up. I tell you, we lift one another up. They ain't got nothing to do with no capitalism. Because capitalism and all that other shit is based on putting something in your pocket and taking it all away from it, everybody else. Thank you. To <laughs> rebut. the mercy of technology. Um, okay, well, I, I thank you very much for your talk. I appreciate very much what you're doing. Um, uh, you, uh, well, anyway, I was just thinking about, um, Jean was saying that uh, you do things for people so they will do things back at you, or with you, or for you, or whatever. And I think really um, to remove all of the being rewarded or punished for doing or not doing the right thing, I think um, 
my philosophy is just to do the right thing regardless as much as I can. So um, I think Catherine Hepburn said it. She said, you know, there's, you just have to be kind to each other. That's it. Um, at any rate, um, I guess, uh, you know, I'm divided. It's a great tradition here not to speak about what the speaker talked about. <laughs> One of our um, things. And so I'll, I'll devote a couple of minutes to um, the irrepressible Doc Woodard. Um, you know, his uh, concept, obviously he has absolutely no medical training. Anybody who knows anything at all about disease pathophysiology can realize that this man does not know anything about, about it, period. Um, diabetes is a disease that is complicated by diet. Um, and um, but is not caused by that diet. You have to have the hereditary whatever it is that take that, that kicks you into the diabetes and actually probably diabetes is or undoubtedly diabetes. There's many different things that cause many different things that cause diabetes and so it's really kind of a wastebasket term for the diseases that result in errors in car carbohydrate metabolism which means that your body, for one reason or another, does not handle the carbohydrates. And carbohydrates is what we use to produce glucose, which is the fuel of, of, on, of our cells. Um, and so uh, th there's a number of different ways. 95% of the people who have diabetes have so-called type 2, or what used to be adult onset diabetes. And you still have insulin. And um, but the insulin, there's errors in the, in the insulin, or there's errors in the insulin receptors, because all the cells have receptors for the insulin that the insulin hooks up on, and is able to put the glucose from the, from the blood circulation into the cell. And so if you don't have those receptors, then you don't get glucose in the cell, and then the cells starve to death, literally, because that's their fuel, is the glucose. So, and that's why your blood glucose goes up, because your cells are screaming for glucose, but and your body keeps putting glucose in the blood, but the glucose doesn't get out. That's the basic problem with, with um, diabetes, is that somehow the glucose doesn't get from the blood into the cells. Now everybody wanted a disease pathology lecture today, right? At any rate, so when you just talk about diet causing diabetes, that's not true. And only diet treatment for diabetes is not true, although sometimes people can really decrease um, their, their disease by losing weight or by changing their diet. Um, so, you know, and then treating cancer, oh my god. Um, anybody who goes to him for cancer treatment is not doing well, not going to do well. Um, because, I mean, he's basically a charlatan and he's been convicted of practicing medicine without a license, which many people here know already, but in fact that's true. So, um, okay, so now that he's been covered with bruises from 10-foot poles, um, the uh, thing about uh, munitions production and I did ask you that question about is that the United States produces more than all of the other countries combined of uh, weapons that sold to foreign countries, <coughs> including landmines and guns and everything else. And, um, you know, we, we do it for a lot of reasons, and, and we do it to control, um, to control other countries, We've, uh, if we don't like the government that's in power, we provide weapons and support, munitions and, and other supports to <coughs> the various rebel, rebel factions or people who, for whatever reason, want to overthrow the government. And so, general, and so we engineer, essentially, a regime overthrow by our provision of arms. And that's probably the real reason we don't sign any, any of those kinds of landmine tr uh, treaties, or um, we don't recognize the world court, a lot, a lot of other things that we don't do because of that, because we're using that to manipulate international affairs. And um, 
that's really pretty much plain wrong, and we're, and we're paying our tax money to support all that. I also want to know. So um, I really applaud the work that you're doing, um, part three here. And um, I wish you great good luck in doing this. And um, I hope to, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll. We'll wait your husband's time. Don't, and don't wait my husband's time. I'll give him the car so I can drive all the way up to Crystal, but he's in our train now. somebody's going to make it. That's what capitalism is. Whether there's a market for derivatives or a market for women's uh, hosiery, there's always a place and somebody will make it. The thing is, is that you have the power to control these markets by with what you spend your money on. Did you know that, for example, one of the reasons that 7-Eleven proliferates all over the country is that one out of every $23 is sold at a gas station or 7-Eleven. Therefore, you're going to see a lot of them. Why do you see a lot of Walmarts around the country? Because people choose to shop there. Why is it that you don't see locally owned businesses being uh, supported or going out of business? Because people like you don't support them or spend your money where you're at. So you as a consumer have a lot of power to do the various things. And I just saw, for example, today that a man of 100 years ago you know, we have about four times more money in disposable income than a young man of maybe four years ago, a hundred years ago would. And how we spend our money, you know, a lot of us consider, you know, today's, you know, today's technology necessities, cell phones, internet access, various other ways that we, smartphones, and we almost consider them necessities, but if you just take the bare luxuries, we're actually a lot cheaper and a lot less of our incomes devoted to it. So we can get things like Gary's problem solved. There's other people out there doing incredible, incredible things throughout the world. And, you know, I just encourage you, if, if it's not Gary's charity or, or something else, look around because you will see that you can, as one individual, teamed up with a lot of others to do a lot of good. <coughs> You got more rebutters. Yes, you don't have. You don't need to know about the topic. <laughs> Nobody else does. <laughs> I knew it would make uh, some people very unhappy if we went home early. Huh. Well, I'm here to. Well, supposed to be unhappy. Huh. This thing is not. Well, it's not here. Huh. It's not here. Uh, Gary can talk for another hour, right, Gary? <laughs> it's the operator's fault. Okay. We are, are 
people, whether we're agnostics or atheists or drunks or, or sober, whatever we are, we generally have some good will. And there are those who will occasionally tap it. That's what churches do. But they have a particular mode of doing it. They will, uh, it's very popular to feed people. Buddhists feed people. Christians feed people. Jews feed people. Muslims feed people. Because feeding people is both a habit, something we've learned to do, and something we like doing. Jesus, aside from feeding the multitude, and I'm sure the decided I mean, really, he got people to share their food. 5,000 people came out once and, uh, to hear him and to uh, get well, what wisdom he could impart to them. And, and while they were there, they learned a little bit about sharing, not that they hadn't ever done so before, but they found an opportunity. He helped them succeed. <coughs> well, but he did other things. He healed the sick. He cared about people, and he showed it. He got people to go on mission. Fishermen gave up fishing and they went out all over the land where they could speak to people. Galilee, because they were Galileans. They even, they were Jews and they went to their fellow Jews in Jerusalem and so on and they, they spoke there about what God can do with them and with others. And, and they went, they stopped being just, you know, speaking to fellow Jews, and they spoke to other people, and people listened because they saw other people doing something good doing something worthwhile. As Gary has gone up to Cambodia to fix sewers, and also maybe to demine agricultural lands. Yeah, you know, one thing leads to another. People learn how to be a blessing to each other. And that's lovely. It's wonderful. Uh, it, it, the, the Communist Party, all, this, all sorts of movements, have done some good. And that has inspired people and helped people to see beyond the limits of whatever it was that was holding them back, uh, whether it was capitalism or uh, state so socialism uh, or, or whatever it was that was holding them back, their nationalism, the, their feeling of inadequacy, uh, their helplessness, we can overcome, whether it's the speakers group, well, well, the, 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 
I, I, I'm drawing a blank here. You see my age limitation. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but uh, Tim, uh, you both have spoken of uh, the uh, postmasters. Yes. <laughs> Whatever it is, yeah. It, you know, trying to address a problem, whether it's drinking with AA or narcotics with narcotics anonymous, well, we can be a help. We can be a host. We can do things. Uh, and even this little group, there are a few of us here tonight, relatively few. Usually we have 30 or 40. But tonight it's only uh, some 23. And we at least learn a little about what other people, like Gary, are doing going out of their way and making possible things that seemed impossible. And I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. Over the last couple of years, I've gotten to know Gary quite well, especially last summer because I was helping him with a few of his projects I really got to know him. What Gary didn't say is out in his workshop out in, in Crystal Lake, he's building another demining machine. This one is being built completely out of what he's found in the garbage. What he's found in scrap. It's not quite working yet. He's still trying to get it moving of its own. But I was out there last summer, and we actually have video of this, but he had it working, and he had it working on air, compressed air, using hydraulics, a hydraulic drive. What he envisions is to have something that would run on battery power, because that's renewable and it's green. He could charge the batteries using solar cells, or run it using solar cells, if we can get it going on electricity. And an interesting thing Gary told me today when he came in the door at my office to work on printing out the, uh, the brochures and such for today, he walks in the door and he tells me, this is the kind of weather I have every day in Cambodia. Think about doing what he's doing in the weather we have here today. Uh, it just gives a, you know, you can see why he's so thin. <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't get heavy there because you it would kill you. But anyway, Gary's a wonderful person, and um, I don't think one other thing he didn't emphasize quite enough is his main means of fundraising. He never ever asks anyone for money, or I've never heard of. Him. He says I need the money, but his main means of fundraising is scrapping something I've helped him with also. And I think that's just a wonderful way of doing things. Thank you, Gary. Hello, I'm Ruth. I just want to say that I've known Gary for about 12, 15 years. And when I first met Gary, I thought he was a real slug, to put it bluntly, because he he was very shy. He was didn't seem to have any direction, didn't seem to have any goals or anything like that. And if you would try to talk to Gary, he would um, You couldn't look you in the eye or say a word. And I have seen him, because of his motivation through what he's working on, grow from that to the well-spoken uh, motivated individual that he is today. And I'm very proud of Gary. I think he's done a wonderful job. I can't resist um, my impressions of your 
so-called doctor. I don't know who he is, but that's the first time I've had the experience of listening to him. And he reminds me of a, one of the black sheep in our own family. I had an uncle who was non-medical uh, and tried to use alternative medicines, but he was he was a high school dropout that went by the professional name of Stanley Mitchell, and he was a hypnotist. And he went, got himself voted into the president, the president of the Hypnotist Society, national president, and spent time working on the uh, league that was uh, hypnotizing people that had claimed that they were uh, kidnapped by aliens. And the government spent a lot of money on that, that uh, club and whatever group it was, and he did several television shows on it. However, he uh, also knew how to cure cancer also, and he, when he got um, prostate cancer, he promptly decided he was going to try the alternative methods on himself, and he's had many years in the grave because of it. Thank you. what to expect. I have to tell you one little thing about Chicago. When I went to Cambodia the first time, one of the top ten things they suggest you do is go to the Genocide Museum, the Killing Fields. So I went there in 2001 and they had a disabled man who was a, a guide for me at the Killing Fields. And he says, where are you from? I said, uh, America, Chicago. He said, Chicago. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or Michael Jordan. No, not Michael Jordan. Al Capone. Al right. So here it is, here in one of the most horrible places that you ever could imagine, Killing Fields of Cambodia. And you mentioned Chicago when you talk about Al Capone. <laughs> I'd like to reverse that and talk about Chicago as being the birthplace of humanitarian demining innovation. Chicago has a great reputation when I talk to other people in Cambodia. They love Chicago. The people that have a chance to tour, they have always good experiences in Chicago. So I would like to just kind of wrap this up and just say that with the eclectic group that we have here, with the resources we have here, with the spirit that's here, I do believe that we can work together to solve these problems, whether it is removing landmines in Southeast Asia or curing cancer. We just have to really work together, believe in each other, learn from each other, listen to each other, even if we don't like what they have to say, we can still learn from them all. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. there was no more people today because if they would have been talking about voodoo or, or some other crazy idea, there would be hundreds of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you have this? Because I want to call the government. And the announcements we didn't hear that next week we will be hearing about Thorium Energy Alliance for Thorium Powered Molten Salt Reactors. That's uh, with John Kutch, uh, the director of uh, TEA, the Thorium Energy Alliance. Hello. And uh, that will be next week. And the week oh, after, on July 21st, experts predict a second dip which yes, could be worse than the first of the US economy. economy. And Geraldine Pennett, Perry, uh, Glenn Fritz, and Steve Walsh of the American Monetary Institute uh, will be uh, presenting.
How about one more round of applause for Gary?